what's the difference with 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 Timberland? Because I know you did some. I missed him. I really miss working with him. He is. I'll give you a quick story. So I'm working with Justin Timberlake, and Justin had an artist named Esme Denters, and Ken at the time, Ken Commissar was the president of uh, um, Tin Man Records. So they flew us out there, and, and Justin was working with Tim on the Duran Duran stuff. And I said, all right. So they flew me out there to London because because Justin did the O2 tour. By the way, if you ever see Justin Timberlake live, he's phenomenal. At that time, he was phenomenal. I haven't seen anything recently, but he's amazing. And also amazing, talented person. We can talk to him later. But with Tim, there was a production crew that Tim was using all the time. And Tim was doing Madonna. And we were oh, doing yeah. Esmeralda's. And both guys, uh, J-Rock and uh, King, were doing the production. And it, they just couldn't get the drums right for some odd reason, right? And they're doing a bunch of shit, right? All of a sudden, Tim comes walk, walking in. And this is why I knew Tim was a far, far more genius than anything else. He came in and this fucking dude goes to the drum machine. I don't know what drum machine it was. I don't know what he did. He went, done. Done. Changed the whole feel of the record. No, you don't need that. Blah, 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 blah. You know, Tim, Tim's like, oh, you don't need that. Let's just try this. Let's try this. Let's try this. He did it in less, less than five minutes. The track was done. Tim's hands. If you're ever blessed with a Tim, if a Timbaland production, it is magical. Anything that that fucking dude touches is magical. Still to this day. Yeah. So is it? Is he? Was he a drummer? Because he seems to. When it comes to the drums, that he he, that seems to drive a lot of his tracks. I think he's more of an innovator. I think he's a tone chaser. Like Teddy was a tone chaser. This fucking dude is a tone chaser. This guy would go in the depths of fucking Egypt to get sound. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, to get different he sounds, is, yeah. He is, he was probably one of the most prolific producers I've ever worked with. Next to Teddy, next to Rodney, he's probably one of the, one of the most prolific. I can't, I mean, every producer I've worked with are very special, and they're very special in their own right. Like, I'm working with Greg Curtis right now. He's he's an amazing producer, great, great, great arranger, really good musician. But there's something about the innovators, like Timbaland. There's very few innovators right now. And I'm not putting down... Listen, I am not putting down any producer to mm. tell you straight out the box. But there's only one Teddy Riley. And there's only one Timbaland. Those two changed... They changed the monarch of the 90s to 2000 sounds. Hands down. Mm. Then, you have the then you have the Rodney Jerkinses. You know what I'm saying? But then you have everybody else. Those are the ones that I gravitate to the most. It's just like a Rick Rubin thing. So I worked with Rick. Uh, and, the co-founder of Death Jam. Yeah, I work with Rick. And everybody used to say, what the fuck does Rick do? <laughs> that was Chris Rock saying that to goes, I know what he's doing. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> you know, it's, you know, you know, you know the greatest thing about Rick Rubin? He, he kind of downplays himself. What Rick does best is what Teddy and Timlin do. He, he innovates people to get the best out of them. That's what Teddy does. That's what Tim does. And that's what a lot of these, you know, D Miles is, is, is another person, but he does it in a different way. Mm -hmm. That's that Tim's just fucking, he's amazing. <laughs> he's amazing. But you, you're also known to, to work with Rodney, and I know you've touched on him quite a bit. When you're working on him with him on the Michael stuff, because what I spoke when I spoke to Rodney, I said to Rodney that if it, you know, he did Rodney did about six, seven songs. I think the Invincible album would have been better if it was just ten songs, but then he added, you know, four or five different tracks that just sort of made it too long and it just went went away and stuff. But he had some real good innovative tracks. Um, you know, we had, um, um. um I think the one I liked was the one that um, that he had with Shaq. I can't remember what it is anymore. Right now, it's, it's, but um, 
But you 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 worked on Invisible with Rodney. I did. I was there from the from from the start, and then I left. Uh, uh, I had okay. to leave. I had to, I had to leave. It was getting to be too much because I was. It was getting to to the point where I was only working on Michael Jackson, and, and at that time, if you you know, I just didn't want to do what I did back when I was working with Teddy and lose out on other opportunities because yeah, you are on a Michael Jackson record, great, you get praises, but. I, I wanted to work with up and coming artists. I've always wanted to do that. I mean, you can't, I, I don't think people really realize, I, I, if anybody knows who I am, I don't give a rat's ass who the hell you are, as long <laughs> as you are respectable. So I've worked with the biggest artists in the world. I worked with Michael, I worked with Celine, I worked with Teddy, I worked with all these people. You're not changing sounds. Young ears are changing sounds. Young artists are changing sounds. And I'd rather go with an indie artist than an established label artist because what the labels do is not what they did back in the day. True a and people are gone. They're gone. And when I left the Rodney camp, I felt that I was punching a clock rather than punching innovation and innovation sound you know that's when I but with Rodney uh on that record it was um it, this cat oh my god I still remember it was me the late great LaShawn Daniels Freddie Harvey Mason Jr. myself I brought two people and I brought Mishka in great writer songwriter and I brought the Pro Tools Ninja in, uh, Paul Foley. Now, you got to understand, Harvey Mason Jr. is a fucking fiend on that Pro Tools. He was basically the one who was teaching us how to use Pro Tools in a different way. He was mm -hmm. amazing. Rodney will be writing, literally, Rodney's catalog on just Michael Jackson alone was over 50 songs. Oh, what? 50. The guy would be doing five to 10 beats a day and they were all great. All of them. All of them. Every single one of them. He'll tell you. Ask Rodney again. He goes, January 6th saying you almost had like 50 songs in the Michael Jackson category. Yes. Literally. And what Rodney was doing, Rodney wanted to go back on the Off the Wall album to get that. You know, that's why... You rock my world, you know. You yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. was that. That was that homage to that time. But also, Michael was. He wanted to push the envelope. He wanted sounds like he literally said this, and I was there, and, and I remember because we had to do the same damn thing on the D Dangerous record. He wanted drums that are not drums. So me and Harvey went to the junkyard to get these drum sounds, breaking shit, closing doors, getting like just crazy stuff. We, I think we had about an hour of, or an hour and a half worth of sounds, breaking glasses, breaking doors. It was, it, it was very, it was very interesting, but I did, you know, when you're dealing with, when you're dealing with Rodney, you're dealing with a heavyweight. Ronnie's like a, a, a boxer. You know, if you put him in the corner, he is going to come out. And that's what happened with Ronnie. That's, that's what makes Ronnie so special at that time. And he was, the, he was the sound at that time. That dude was doing it. I just had to leave. I had to, I had to flare out. But Ronnie did bring me back to, um, he said, Jean, you got to come back and do privacy. Oh, but privacy, yeah. We were in Studio One, all of us, and I'm living in California. It felt like I was back in Virginia Beach again, where I used to sleep underneath the console. Tell if you ever talk to Teddy again, ask him where where does Jean Marie used to sleep. <laughs> He'll tell you straight out. I, he was trying to. He was trying, he was mad at me because he couldn't find me. Right? He thought, see, man, I didn't want him to leave. Blah 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 blah. And he's talking his jargon, right? I'm underneath the console because that's the warmest spot in the studio was underneath the SSL board. 
Wow. I grabbed him by his leg. He's what the hell? I was like, I said, I'm, I'm always here, man. I'm always here. He goes, what are you doing down there? I said, I, this is my place where I sleep. So no one can mess with me. No one can find me. Because every time when Teddy leaves, everybody in the front office was always wanting something. So I had to do all the clerical work and all the paperwork. That's the one thing I learned from Teddy was I was everything at that time. It was crazy. So I had to find some some time to sleep. Everybody was sleeping in the uh in the uh sound lock rooms, the the live room or the wow. local booth. So I had to find a spot and I found it right underneath the middle right in the console. <laughs> oh, I had these big crazy. old I had these big old bowwinkle slippers that I used as like as pillows. Yeah, those... Oh, it was it was amazing. 